Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see your faces this morning. I missed you last week. Did everyone have a good fall break? Yeah, I can't wait to hear more about it during the passing of the piece and during lunch if you decide to stay. Um, if you have been following our preacher schedule for the semester, you would have seen that today was supposed to be our pride service. However, due to some circumstances, that service has been postponed to the spring semester. So we will be having a pride service, um, but it will be now in the spring semester. So when we release our spring semester schedule, you'll see when that date will be. So um, I will be preaching this morning, and I hope you're not tired of me yet. So, <laughs> Mari. Um, so I just want us to start if um, we can all just take a collective deep breath together. So breathe in with me and breathe out. As we come to worship today, let us be open to what God has to say to us this morning. And with that, let us stand and sing our first song. Give it up for the mics working today.
Good morning, family. Our first reading today comes from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, oh, this is verse 8. Yep, yep, I got confused. <laughs> Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent, or praiseworthy. Think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Merciful God, whose name is love, abundant, overflowing, and unceasing love, hold us close to you today. Love us with compassion. During all the moments when we are overwhelmed with uncertainty and fear, we still give thanks for your understanding love. Love us with patience, Lord. Despite all the mistakes and missteps we make, Despite all the times we ignore your teaching and forget your grace, we still give thanks for your forgiving love. Help us to love each other as you love us, to accept others without judgment, to see the difference as your gift of creation, to remember that love is our greatest calling. We pray all this in the name of God, the creator of love who loves this world. Amen. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Passing of the Peace time, which is our special time only we can see at the beloved community. This time, I invite you all to stand up, greet each other, and send peace. I know we had a fall break, so most of us have not seen each other. So I hope we can learn something new about each other by sharing how we have been. Now let's stand up and share God's peace. Let's go. <laughs>
And that, as we know, is our signal to return to our seats. Um, before I invite Josh up, I just want to do like a quick celebration because I just learned something about two of our members. And this may be true for some other people. So if this is also true for you, let me know. But um, just Sonia and Lauren got into the nursing school on Friday. So that is exciting. We love to hear about the good things in your life and l celebrate with you. So if you have any good news, always let us know. Um, and with that, I'm going to invite Josh up to do our second reading. Congrats, y'all. <laughs> I'm so happy for y'all. And uh, yeah, let's go to our second reading. Um, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. This is the word for the God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Pray with me. God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you. Amen. Thank you, Josh, for that great reading. The last time I publicly read Psalm 23 was last November at my grandmother's funeral. The psalm is commonly used at funerals, and I was asked by the pastor leading the service if I would read the scripture. My grandmother's health was declining, and we knew that her death would be coming soon, and I had told my parents, I am not leading the service. I'm going to be a grandchild at this. I'm not going to be in charge. It's like a hazard of being clergy that you get called upon to do all of the things at family gatherings. And so I did agree, though, to do this reading and standing graveside, I read this psalm and only made it through about the first verse before I started crying. This psalm is so widely used because it genuinely and earnestly conveys our human spirit. When we are in times of need, there is only one source of comfort. When we are in the darkest valley, we can't rely on our own strength. When we are in the midst of total darkness, there is nowhere on earth that we can turn. When we are in the valley of the shadow of death, our hope must come from beyond ourself. And I don't know about you, but I feel like we are in a constant state of total darkness. This is the longest valley, and I am tired. I'm tired of waking up every morning to more news of significant loss of life. Natural disasters are wiping out communities, the fires in Maui, earthquakes in Morocco, floods in Libya, and just last weekend, another tragic earthquake in Afghanistan killed thousands. It feels as if the earth itself is groaning right now. And news of war. Unfortunately, we've become used to news of the war in Ukraine, of headlines about what's happening between Ukraine and Russia, and now another war has broken out after thousands of lives were taken in a terrorist attack. The images coming out of Israel, Palestine, alert us to the frailty of our lives. Thousands are think seeking food and water and shelter. We also know that there is tragedy that we don't know about because it's either intentionally covered up or it's not mentioned or highlighted in our news. Our world is full of dark valleys, of spaces where death's shadow lurks. And we have our own internal 
personal dark valleys. For some, it's losing a loved one. If you've experienced that while at college, I recognize that that's like an even harder space to lose someone because you're away from the community that knew the person that can support you in that time. And it's just weird to talk about grief when you're you know, writing a paper or working on a group project. For others, the Dark Valley is consistent rejection, either from friends, from people you're trying to get to know, from potential employers, from graduate programs. For some, the Dark Valley is isolation and loneliness. In a recent article from the Harvard Gazette, researcher Tyler Vandeweel noted that social isolation and loneliness have negative health impacts and that about 50% of Americans reported being lonely. And research shows that loneliness negatively impacts our sense of hope and purpose and increases the likelihood of depression. It can feel like we are in total darkness. So in the midst of this darkness, I am thankful that one of the assigned readings for this Sunday was this Psalm, Psalm 23. This Psalm speaks so perfectly to our human condition and our need for hope, our need for comfort, our need for shelter, and the necessity of finding those outside of ourselves. Verse one says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We are taught to want everything, right? We are taught to want the latest clothes, the newest car, the best house. I recently saw an article on Facebook that was titled, the 10 Kindle accessories you need to rush to buy. I mean, did you all even know that there are 10 Kindle accessories that you could have? I don't know what you would need besides like a case and a screen protector, but apparently these things exist. And so we're always taught, we're inundated with news of wanting more. But with God, our want is satisfied. And this verse is actually deeper than that. It can literally be translated, I shall lack nothing, or I shall not lack. And I find a different connotation with that, that with God, we lack nothing. There is nothing that we could need or want that God does not provide. Verses 2 and 3 continue by showing us what God gives us, how God keeps us from lacking. The psalmist says, He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. The pasture can represent food. And the inclusion of the adjective green, or in some translations, grassy, tells us that this pasture is full and abundant. I don't know what, you know, your experience is with cows or, or animals grazing in a field, but you can tell a difference when the land is green and luscious and when it is dry and lacking. This image is of plenty to be eaten. And the next phrase, that he leads me beside still waters, can literally read something like, he causes me to water in places of rest. And I love that line from the song we just sang, that I will rest in the Father's hands and leave the rest in the Father's hands. So if the pasture represents food, then the water represents drink. The shepherd, God, takes care of two of our basic needs, food and water, and he does so abundantly. Verse 3 says, he restores my soul. And the word translated soul actually means the whole being or life. Some translations connect this with the water image and read near tranquil waters he will guide me to refresh my being. And when I was preparing for this sermon this morning that translation that difference really struck me because to me for my being to be restored it seems more holistic that it's not just my soul but it is my mind, my emotions, my physical body, my outlook on life. This broader restoration happens because God provides for our basic needs. We can be restored because our needs are met. Verse 3 continues, He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. A shepherd guides its sheep, its sheep and wants to guide them to safety, avoiding dangerous terrain or places where thieves lurk. And taken together with verse 2, the complete image that the psalmist evokes is that of being kept alive. When God is our shepherd, God meets our needs. 
God's intention is to provide for our basic needs and to lead us to safety. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean it's going to be a straight path or easy terrain. Because the psalmist continues, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and staff, they comfort me. And we've named what some of our dark valleys can be. And honestly, y'all, that list could go on. There are so many more things that we can name. In the context of the scripture, the psalmist recognizes that the dark valleys are where predators lurk, where darkness hides those who would seek to harm the sheep. There are dangers and hardships, trials and tribulations, dark valleys and unclear roads that we will face in this life. That's one thing I love about the Psalms, though. They don't shy away from naming the hard things. Life will be hard. Life will, we will face dark seasons in life. You may be in one right now. And yet, and yet the psalmist says, I will fear no evil for you are with me. God is with us and God is our comforter. One of the questions I had to answer when I was getting commissioned to become clergy was, quote, what is your understanding of evil as it exists in the world? Just a light, easily answered question. Just, you know, could answer that in a few words. As we see constantly in the news, evil abounds. Lamentably, evil is perpetrated by ordinary citizens and has become so commonplace that it's virtually invisible. Intense, daring, destructive suffering is not the dramatic, horrible exception. It has become the rule. But evil is not the end. Evil does not get the final say. In verse 4, there is a shift in the way the psalmist connects to the shepherd. Up until this point, the shepherd, or God, has been referred to in the third person. But in verse 4, it shifts to the second person. You lead me. And this direct address heightens the expression of intimacy in God's presence. The psalmist has a relationship with the shepherd, can be open and honest about what they're experiencing. The psalmist names their fear but knows that, God's will meet, that God will meet their needs and keep them safe. In the final two verses, this metaphor shifts from that of a shepherd to that of a host. The psalmist says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Again, the psalmist's basic needs are met abundantly. When we are in God's presence, our darkest valleys can become abundant tables. When we are in God's presence, the table reminds us of the presence that Jesus sat at with his friends the night before he died. At this meal, Jesus made a promise, a new covenant with him, and that he asked them to remember this covenant by partaking of bread and wine. And that is what we remember today when we celebrate communion. When we remember God's abundant provision, when we take communion, it reminds us that we are part of that inherited covenant. And as somebody who loves to throw a good dinner party, I cannot wait to feast at God's heavenly banquet. The psalmist continues, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The word translated here as mercy is this Hebrew word hesed. It's a really good like guttural sound that I can't really make. Hesed. Which is usually translated as love. And it has the connotation of a covenant. Hesed does not suggest some kind of generic love for everyone. Like marital love, covenantal love, or this hesed, is given within the context of a relationship where it is already promised and where the recipient is commanded to respond in kind. Furthermore, the word translated as follow it can really be better understood as the active pursuing of someone. So taken together, this covenantal love and this active pursuing shows us the picture of God's love for us. God seeks a relationship with us before we're even aware of it. Whether it's through our parents or other people in our lives like teachers or friends or other family members, the beauty of nature or through scripture, God can work in our lives before we even recognize it. 
before we've even responded to it, God's grace and love are working in our lives, and God prepares a place for us. Psalm 23 ends with, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. One translation I read says, And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for days without end. This is the promise of eternal life with God. As the meta metaphor shifted from shepherd to host, what was once a pasture is now a house, a place of welcome, hospitality, shelter, and rest. This house of the Lord is our destination. And in God's house, all of our needs are met. We lack nothing. When we can't see another source for our basic needs, food, water, shelter, God provides. When we don't know how to have hope, God guides us on the right path. When we see evil every day, God comforts us. When we are hungry, God prepares a table. And when we need rest, God opens the door of his house. When God is the one meeting our needs, we are fully restored. We are fully refreshed. When I was in seventh grade, I experienced what I could call my first dark valley. It was 2001, and shortly into the school year, the attacks of September 11th happened. And this was the first major tragedy that I remember, the first major national tragedy. And I was just like glued to the news. I was glued to the TV. This was the time in the time of VHS tapes. Do y'all know what those are? And I remember just recording the news, just like ran tape after tape to record it so I could like remember this. I still have those tapes. In October of that same year, my ballet teacher, Ms. Coleman, got suddenly sick and about a month later died. And her daughter was a year older than me in school. And she was the first person that I knew personally to die. And so that was, that shook me up. Then days after Thanksgiving, my granddad, my dad's dad, got sick with pneumonia and he died on December 20th. And I was very close with granddaddy because we had spent weeks each summer at their house and my cousins and I would go. He would take us to the library to check out movies. We loved the Muppet movies in particular. He would take us on adventures. And so as a seventh grader, I didn't know what to do with all of these emotions I had. And I have like pretty big, pretty big feelings and or how to face death. I was raised in the church, but on our winter youth retreat that January or February, I asked our youth minister, Brian, to lead me in a prayer of my own that would mark a shift in my relationship with God. That was the night I responded to God's grace and God's work in my life and claimed my faith for myself. That doesn't mean that my life has been easy since then. I've had multiple dark seasons and seasons of total darkness since then. But I no longer have to fear those seasons because I know God is with me. I am confident that God is guiding me and leading me to abundant life. So if you're here this morning and you have made a similar commitment, I encourage you to hold on to the promises of Psalm 23. If you are in a dark valley this morning, know that God is our comforter and our guide. God leads us to food and shelter and water. And eventually, on the other side of this life, we will have all of those things in ways we cannot even fathom right now. If you're not in a dark valley, but you have made that commitment, cultivate your trust in God so that when the darkness comes, you have confidence not to fear evil. You know that God is your comforter and your provider. If you're here this morning and you have not made that commitment or are curious about what it looks like, let's talk. Reach out to me. Talk to me after the service. We can go get coffee, go for a walk, and talk about what it looks like to respond to God's grace. God prepares a table for us and has room for us in his house. Even in total darkness, may we find our way there. Amen.
for the prayers of the people when I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. Dear God, thank you for another Sunday here at Beloved Community. Thank you for the chance to be with each other in this chapel, to pray, to listen, to share our faith and our worries. Thank you for all the spaces like this where we can come exactly as we are. In difficult times, help us be attuned to our needs and the needs of others. Comfort us in our confusion, our sorrow, our stress. Shower us with your goodness and your mercy, Lord, in your mercy. God, we pray for the safety and well-being of our Emory community. Our students, our professors, faculty, chaplains, counselors, alumni, all the people who make Emory what it is. Help us to appreciate each other, to keep practicing awareness and sensitivity no matter how difficult. God, help us to know that you are here for us. Help us to know this, especially when we feel far from love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God, we pray for all of those dead in the attack against Israel. We pray for all of the people suffering from the war in Israel and Palestine. We ask you to comfort the students at Emory, whose friends and family are affected by this war. Lend your spirit, your rod, and your staff in the hard times ahead. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer and for the intentions we hold in the quiet of our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. I invite you to join me in saying the Lord's Prayer out loud. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Beautiful prayer, Celie. Thank you. So our announcements this morning, I do kind of have a few, so bear with me. Um, this Saturday is our Interfaith Center open, like grand opening, official grand opening as part of the homecoming celebrations this weekend. You are invited to come. It will be at 3 o'clock at the Interfaith Center, which is 1707 North Decatur Road, We're right across the street from the law school. If you want to let us know you're here, you can scan this QR code and fill out a short, short form. Um, we are looking for one or two um, student volunteers for Emory Giving Week. If you would like to be a volunteer to um, talk about Christian life, really what that would look like is just post, mostly just posting on your social media um, about your experience with Christian life and inviting people to give to the Christian Life Fund here at Emory. So if you would be willing to do that, um, see me after the service or at lunch today. Um, let's see what else. So on Friday, October 27th, so in two weeks, there's going to be a Muskogee teach-in. Um, for those who were here last year, did anyone go to the teach-in that, that we did last year on the quad? Just Sonia did? Yeah. So we are on Muskogee ancestral mm -hmm. land, and so we are going to have members of the Muskogee Nation from Oklahoma come here on Friday, October 27th to do a teach-in. There's going to be remarks by Emory and Muskogee leaders, a Muskogee hymn sing. There's gonna be an artist conversation about Muskogee art and culture and a stomp dance led by Reverend Chavon Colonel. If you would like to participate in that, it's gonna be in the um, multi-purpose rooms and you can register for that um, through the Emory OSRL e-news. Um, another reminder that the Voices concert is coming up shortly on November 11th so if you would like to attend that it's going to be in here at 7 o'clock on November 11th 
I promise you, you will not be disappointed that you came. It will revive your soul, as we are talking about this morning. And then lastly, um, if you want to participate in our Worship Sunday on November 5th, that's in three weeks, y'all. Um, yeah. Um, come see me or Mari after the service. We would love to have you. If you have written original stuff, uh, we would love to have you sing that. Um, if you have um, just a musical talent that you would love to share with us, please um, let us know and we can make sure that we get you as part of that service. So uh, thank you and let us stand for our final song. Please remain standing for the benediction. I will read it once in your hearing, and then please join along with me. May God bless us with this comfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships. 
that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitations of people so that we may live for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in the world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Together? May God bless us with this comfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships that we may live deep within our hearts. May God bless us with anger and injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless us with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, injustice, starvation, and war so that we may reach out our hands to turn their and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless us with enough foolishness to believe we can make a difference in the world so that we claim what others claim cannot be done. Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>